Welcome. In this video, we'll formally define the language of propositional logic, and we'll show that we've done a good job by proving a unique parsing theorem, which tells us that any formula can be interpreted only in one way. The first definition we'll see is that of a signature for our language, which is essentially just the names of the variables that we'll be using for our propositions. So a signature sigma is just a countable set of symbols and we have the restriction that it's not allowed to contain any of the following symbols. So it's not allowed to contain any of these logical connectives, nor this absurdity symbol. And finally, it's not allowed to contain either of these left or right parentheses. The reason for this is that we'll be using these symbols here, uh, well, for the logical connectives and for separating our uh, parts of the formulas. And so we don't want these symbols to also occur as variable names. The second restriction here is that the, the set, the accountable set, which just means that we can list out, in principle, all of the um, symbols occurring in it in an infinite list. And this will just make our lives easier when we prove completeness. In principle, you could also choose an uncountable set of symbols. But really, for our purposes here, there's no advantage to doing so. And it will just make the set theory required to prove things much more difficult. The default choice of signature, which I'll be using in this video, is the following. So I'll set sigma to be the following set. So it just contains p0, p1, p2, and so on. So it's just these p's indexed by the natural numbers. Now here, it's important that we view this entire thing. So the entire p0 is a single symbol. And similarly for p1 and so on. So these, these things here are entire symbols in, in and of themselves. If you're unhappy with the signature, in principle, you could use a different one, maybe containing also things like R and S and Q and so on. But as long as your collection is also infinite and countable, it'll anyways be in bijection with this one here. So it doesn't really matter so much which signature we choose. I guess if you wanted, you could also choose a finite signature. So one that only contains a finite number of symbols for your propositions. But that would somehow limit the expressivity of your logic because you can't have formulas that contain more variable names than the number of symbols you have in your signature. However, none of the results that we'll be proving actually use the fact that this signature here has an infinite number of symbols. So any result would also hold for a finite signature if you wanted to build a logic that only has finitely many symbols for variable names. Once we've fixed a signature sigma, we're going to write LP sigma for the language of propositions that have uh, this signature sigma. In other words, for each choice of signature, we get like a dialect of this language for propositional logic. And we'll just denote that LP sigma. However, in this video, I'll be sort of forgetting about this signature business. So I'm just going to kind of assume that we've chosen this default signature here. And then I'm not really going to think so much about um, what would happen if we chose other signatures instead. As I said, the results that we'll prove aren't going to depend on the choice of signature anyways. And if you really wanted to be super rigorous, you would actually show that, well, it doesn't matter which signature you choose to get the, the results. Now that we've fixed our alphabet for our language, we're now going to define what formulas are in the language. Just like in English, where we have an alphabet of letters and we can build those together to build words, we're going to be able to build these uh, symbols we have together into formulas. However, just like in English, it's going to be the case that not every string of symbols will make sense. Rather, formulas in our logic will be exactly the ones that follow these rules that I'm about to present. So this is an inductive definition. We'll see what that means once I go through it. The first point here says that every symbol of our signature sigma plus this absurdity symbol here is a formula. So if I just write down one of the elements of my signature, so that's like a variable name for a proposition, that constitutes a formula. And similarly, if I just write down this absurdity symbol, that's also a formula. Later, we'll be calling these formulas, which just consist of a single symbol, so one that's either a variable name from our signature or this absurdity symbol, we'll be calling those formulas atomic. And so somehow these form like the basis for building up all other formulas. This brings me to the second point here, which says that if we already have some existing formula phi, well, then 
also the formula which we get by adding this negation symbol in front of the formula and surrounding it by parentheses, that will also be a formula. In other words, I can take any existing formula phi and I can negate it and that result will again be a formula. So while point one here gives us a stock of formulas to start building with, point two allows us to convert existing formulas into new ones. And the same will hold for point three here. So it says that if we have two existing formulas, phi and psi, then so are the following. So we can either form the conjunct like this, phi and psi, surrounded by parentheses, phi or psi, phi implies psi, and uh, phi if and only if psi. As you can see, point three is basically the same type of rule as point two, just instead of using this unary connective here of negation, we're using these binary connectives. So we are combining two existing formulas into a new one. Now during this combination process, it's always important that we surround the new formulas by parentheses. And the reason for this is that we want to be able to unambiguously interpret um, at what step we applied what connective. In fact, we'll see in the proof of this unique parsing theorem that we'll show at the end of the video that these parentheses will be very essential um, to make that work. All right, so point one tells us what their basic building blocks are. Point two and three tells us how to build more complex formulas out of simpler ones. And then now point four says that, well, nothing else is a formula aside from formulas obtained by the first uh, three points. That's what makes this definition here inductive. So it says that the only things that are formulas are objects that can be constructed using these three rules. Here, rule one acts like the base case. So it tells us what atomic formulas are. And then rules two and three tell us how we can take existing formulas and build up a formula that is one level more complex than the original formula. Hence, any formula that's constructed using these rules will have to have started out as some, well, as some atomic formulas, which are then combined iteratively using rules two and three. In particular, there will have been a last rule which was applied in constructing the formula. And well, if this last rule was either two or three, then we give the connective that was introduced in this last step a name, namely the head of the formula. Hence, every formula which is not atomic will have a head, which was the last connective introduced with either rule two or three. Let me give you an example of this straight away. So let's consider the following formula, which says that uh, P1 implies that, well, the absurdity and not P0. Let's think about how this formula can be built up using these rules. The first thing we can do is identify the atomic propositions. So that would be uh, P1 here. We have this absurdity symbol and then P0. Now by rule one, these things individually are all formulas. So let's maybe color code things. So rule one will be blue. And then next we see that here we're applying this negation symbol to P0. So that would be rule two. And I can apply rule two to the atomic formula, which is just P0 itself. And that thing is a formula by, by point one. So here I'm applying rule two. Okay, and then as a final color, let's uh, choose pink for rule three. And I'm applying rule three twice. So on the one hand, I'm introducing this conjunction here. And this conjunction is combining this atomic formula consisting of the absurdity symbol together with this more complex formula, which I got um, from applying rule two to P0. So I can introduce uh, this conjunction symbol here using uh, rule three. And then finally, we see that uh, this connective here um, combines the atomic formula P1 together with this larger formula I got uh, from before. So that also uses rule three, but in this case with the implication symbol. And well, now we can see that this formula here basically has the form phi implies psi, where phi is uh, P1 and psi is this more complicated formula we had here. And therefore, in building up this formula, the last connective we introduced was this implication symbol, and that makes this implication symbol the head of the formula. So this thing here, this is the head. 
and we can spot it by eye by looking at the bracketing. So because these brackets here sort of surround an entire formula, we see that the, this thing is actually of this form. And therefore, uh, the last connective we introduced, so using rule 3, that needs to be the head. Now, in fact, the argument we'll be using to show that every formula can be parsed in a unique way will be making use of the brackets in the formula to show that every formula has a unique head. A nice way to visualize the structure of formulas is using parsing trees. So here I have a formula that's similar to the one from before. So it says that P0 implies that not P1 or P2. And I'm going to go ahead and just draw the parsing tree for this. So a parsing tree has as leaves the atomic propositions that occur in it. So in this case, it's P0, P1, and P2. So these will form the leaves of the tree. And we're drawing the tree sort of upside down in this case. And then, well, each time we apply one of the rules, so we introduce a new connective, we indicate it by a node in the tree. For example, here I see that the P1 is being negated as a first step. So I'm going to draw a node here that's labeled by the negation symbol. And I'm going to connect it up to P1 like this. Then in the next step, we're combining this negated formula, not P1, with P2 using OR. And so this will form another node, which I label with the OR connective. And I connect up, well, the formula I got, not P1, with uh, P2 using this node like this. And now the last connective we're introducing is this implication symbol here. And it combines this atomic proposition P0 with this larger formula, which we constructed and is represented here by this node. So for this, I write a new node, which I label with the implication arrow like this. And then I combine it well with P0 like this and connect it down to uh, this node here. OK, so this uh, forms the parsing tree for the formula. And well, the way to interpret this is you start at the leaves and then you kind of move upwards and build up the formula as you go. So here I would start at P1. And I see that the first node here is a negation. So if I kind of move P1 up the tree here, I would get the formula not P1. And then here this node combines whatever I got in the previous node together with uh, P2. So here I'm combining uh, not P1 together with P2 using this junction like this. And finally, this top node here combines whatever I got from this node together with P0. And so here I get then the final formula P0 implies uh, not P1 or P2 like this, and it's all surrounded in parentheses. So as you can see, I recover the, the formula I started with by moving up the parsing tree. The parsing tree here also allows us to identify the head of the formula. So the head will just be the last node, so the, the topmost node in the parsing tree. OK. Now, because each formula has to be built up using the rules in the definition, it means that each formula has to have at least one parsing tree. So there has to be at least one way of building up the formula using, well, the rules. On the other hand, it's not clear at the moment that the way of building up this formula is unique. This means that in principle, there could be formulas for which there are different ways of constructing them using the rules in the definition. Now, for such formulas, we wouldn't be able to say with confidence which was the last rule that was applied. So that notion wouldn't really make sense because there could be several different ways in which we could construct the formula. And in each of those ways, there could be a different last rule which was applied. However, when we interpret these formulas, it's really important to have a uh, properly defined last connective which was applied. So this implication here somehow serves as the main connective for this formula. So it says that, well, this part of the formula implies this part of the formula. And well, if there was like another connective occurring in the formula, which could be interpreted as a similar main connective, then this formula would be ambiguous. So it would mean that it doesn't have a well-defined meaning. As an example of where this occurs, let's say I had something like P0 implies P1 and P2, like this. 
Well, here in this case, I could build up this formula in several different ways. I could, well, start with p1 and p2, and then introduce the conjunction, and then in the last step, introduce this implication. Or alternatively, I could start with p0 and p1 and introduce the implication, and then in the last step, introduce the conjunction. So this means that here in this not well formed formula, so it doesn't follow our definition from before. Well, in this formula, we have like two connectives, which could be the last step in the construction, which means there's two connectives, which could possibly be a main connective for this formula. And if you see this formula here, you see it's ambiguous, because either it could mean that p0 implies p1 and p2 like this, or it could mean that p0 implies p1 and also p2 uh, interpreted with the bracketing I indicated there. And those two things have different meanings. So that's why it's essential for a formula to have a unique head. And this will in turn imply that every formula has a unique parsing tree, because if we are given the head of a formula, we can decompose it into two uh, or one smaller part. And then we can just kind of iterate like that and break it down into smaller pieces. And that will give us the parsing tree. Now in the remaining part of the video, we'll be proving that, well, every formula can be parsed in an unambiguous way by showing that every formula has a unique head. So in other words, this type of situation here can't apply if we construct formulas using the definition. For the proof, we'll be needing some additional definitions. The first one is called the complexity of a formula. So the complexity of a formula phi is just the number of connectives that occur in it. In other words, for each formula, you can just count the number of connectives occurring in it, and that will give you some natural number, which is called its complexity. Now, if there are no connectives in the formula, then we call the formula atomic. So formulas of complexity 0 will be called atomic. That's our terminology I introduced before when I was describing uh, formulas. Let's just do a couple quick examples of this. So here, this formula we looked at previously, if I go and count the connectives, I see it has one, two, three connectives. So this formula would have complexity three. Whereas these two formulas here, they just consist of a single symbol, and there are no connectives in them. So they both have complexity zero, and hence are atomic formulas. In our proof, we'll also need a way to subdivide formulas into smaller pieces um, called segments. So uh, this definition looks a bit complicated, but the idea is not so complicated as we'll see in the example, which I'll present right after it. So we're going to first consider a string of symbols. So I'm going to call this string epsilon. So this will be a, like a formula containing n symbols. So we'll call the symbols a1 up through a n. So it's something like a1, a2, and, and so on. And now a segment of this string is just a substring consisting of some consecutive symbols. So here I'm calling this ai dot 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 up to aj. So this would be something of the form ai, ai plus one, and so on, all the way up to aj, where i and j lie between one and n. We're going to call a segment initial if it like starts at the beginning of the string. So if i here is equal to one. And we're going to call a segment proper if its length is strictly less than n. So if it's a segment that isn't the entire string. And finally, whenever we're given an initial segment, s, we're going to define something called its depth. And this is just the number of opening parentheses minus the number of closing parentheses occurring in s. So for this definition, it's easiest just to illustrate all of these concepts using this example formula we had previously. So in our case, this formula will be interpreted as a string of symbols. So the first symbol here will be the parentheses. Then the second symbol will be this p0. Then the third symbol will be the implication arrow, and so on. So each parentheses is an individual symbol. And um, also these uh, p1s and p2s, these count as uh, single symbols. Okay, so this goes on up to whatever this last symbol is. So let's maybe just count this. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this would be a 12 here. And now a segment of, uh, well, this formula would be some substring of these symbols. 
So for instance, I could just choose, let's say, A3 up to this disjunction symbol. So this thing here would be a segment uh, of this, yeah, of this formula. Now in this case, this segment will be proper because its length is less than 12. Now in the proof, we'll mostly be interested in initial segments. So the initial segments of this uh, formula here are the following. So we have first just the initial segment consisting of the opening parentheses. Then we have the initial segment consisting of the opening parentheses and P0. Then we have the one consisting of P0 and the implication. And I just kind of go along the formula uh, like so, uh, et cetera. And now to each initial segment, we also associate a number called its depth, which is the number of opening parentheses occurring minus the number of closing parentheses occurring in it. So here, this uh, initial segment here would have depth one because there's one opening parentheses. Then there's one here also, one here also, here there's two, and here there's three. Now in these ones I've drawn, we don't actually have any closing parentheses occurring, but maybe as an example, let's uh, consider the initial segment uh, like so, this one. So this one uh, has three opening parentheses and one closing parentheses. And uh, therefore, its depth would be 3 minus 1, which is equal to 2. Now, the reason this concept of depth is useful is because it will allow us to identify the head of a formula. For this, let's think about at what depth each of these connectives in this formula occurs. So if you look at uh, this uh, implication symbol here, this one occurs at depth 1 because we have to traverse one opening parentheses in order to reach it. So this has depth one. Uh, so this negation symbol here has depth three because we need to go past three opening parentheses to get to it. And finally, this uh, disjunction symbol here has depth two because, well, we go past three opening parentheses here and then we close one of them, so we're at depth two. And you can now notice that uh, these numbers here correspond exactly to like the, the level at which we introduced uh, the connectives when we drew the parsing tree. So the negation here was the first thing we introduced, then the disjunction was the second thing we introduced, and then the uh, implication here was the last thing we introduced. And it'll turn out that, well, there is a unique connective occurring at depth one, and that's exactly the last connective you introduce, which is the head of the formula. In fact, that will pretty much exactly be what we'll be proving in the next lemma. Let's now turn to the precise statement of the lemma I was talking about before. So it says that if we're given some formula chi, which is in our language LP sigma, then the following hold. So first of all, chi itself has depth zero. So this means that if you count the number of opening parentheses in chi, it'll be the same as the number of closing parentheses. Intuitively, this makes sense because whenever we're introducing parentheses, we're introducing, well, them in pairs, so of an opening one and a closing one. So chi should overall have depth zero. The second point says that every proper initial segment of chi has a depth strictly greater than zero. So this means that if we're taking some initial segment which isn't the entirety of the formula chi, well then we're missing some of the closing parentheses, and so the depth should be strictly greater than zero. And finally, part C is really the important point, which is that if chi has complexity greater than zero, so it's not an atomic formula, then there is exactly one connective occurring at depth one, and this is in fact the head of the formula chi. So that's exactly what we saw in the example before. We saw that this implication symbol was the only connective occurring at depth one, and it was also the head of the formula. Okay, so let's go about proving this. And so the proof will be uh, by induction on the complexity of the formula in question. Now, basically, because we've defined formulas with an inductive definition, all the properties that we're going to prove for formulas will also use inductive proofs. Because, well, we just need to check it for the base case, and then we need to check that each of the further steps used in the construction of such formulas um, also preserves the properties we're interested in. Okay, so the base case um, is when 
chi is itself atomic, meaning that it has complexity zero. Okay, what can we say about chi in this case? Well, if chi is atomic by definition, well, chi is either p for some uh, proposition symbol occurring in our signature sigma, um, or chi could also be this uh, absurdity symbol. But those are the only two possibilities because the only way we can get atomic propositions are by using rule one from the definition, which said exactly that any symbol in sigma plus this absurdity symbol here, those are, well, the atomic uh, formulas we can build. Okay, so now that we know a bit more about chi, we're going to check points A through C in this case. The first thing we need to check is that chi itself has depth zero. Well, we can see that in either case, chi just consists of a single symbol and there are no parentheses occurring. So the depth of this formula is zero minus zero, which is zero. So chi has depth zero. Uh, well, since uh, no parentheses occur, So that verifies point A. The second point we need to check is B, that every proper initial segment of chi has a depth strictly greater than zero. So at first glance, this might seem like it's a problem because we don't have any parentheses in chi. On the other hand, chi actually doesn't even have any proper initial segments. If you go back to the definition of what a well segment was of a, of a string, you'll see that it has to contain at least one symbol. Now, because chi itself just consists of a single symbol, any proper segment of chi would have to have a length zero, but that isn't possible. So uh, chi has no uh, proper uh, segments. I mean, so this means in particular that it also doesn't have any proper initial segments and uh, hence point B holds. So it is in fact true that every proper initial segment, well, there are none uh, of chi, has uh, whatever condition, this depth being greater than zero. Okay, so point B is trivially true because there are no proper initial segments of chi to start with. And finally, uh, point C says that if chi has complexity greater than zero, so it's a not atomic, well, then something holds. But, uh, well, chi is atomic in our case, so point C is true because chi does not have complexity greater than zero. So point C doesn't apply and uh, hence holds. Okay, so since uh, chi is atomic, uh, C holds as well. Just again, because it's a trivial implication, so we're claiming stuff about formulas of complexity greater than zero but in fact, chi does not have complexity greater than zero, so whatever we're claiming will automatically hold for it. Okay, so taken together, we've checked um, A through C in this base case where chi is an atomic formula. Essentially here, it's easy because in that case, chi just consists of a single symbol, which automatically has depth zero and doesn't have any proper initial segments and well, is atomic, so it does not have complexity strictly greater than zero. So really only the point uh, that is important here is A, and this holds because there are no parentheses occurring if you just have a single symbol in the formula. All right, so this brings us to the general case where the complexity of chi is, well, not zero, so it's some number k, which is strictly greater than zero. Moreover, in this case, because we're performing induction, we're now allowed to assume that these three claims here hold for formulas that have complexity strictly less than k. Okay, so what can we say about chi in this case? Well, we know that its complexity is strictly greater than zero, so it's not atomic, and therefore by the inductive definition of formulas, there has to have been a last step which was applied, which in this case would have had to have been rule uh, two or three. So this means uh, chi has the form well, either it's uh, been rule two, which was applied last, so it would be of the form not phi, or it's rule three, and then it would be one of the following. So uh, phi and psi, uh, phi or psi, you could have 
phi implies psi or uh, phi if and only if psi. So just to be absolutely clear, what we're claiming is that chi has at least one of the following forms. So maybe I should have written has at least uh, one uh, of the forms uh, that are given over here. The reason we can be sure about this is because we know that chi is a formula and therefore it follows this inductive definition and so it has to have had like a last step in its construction. On the other hand, we're still not sure whether chi has exactly one of these forms. So in principle, we still have to uh, assume that it's possible that chi could be simultaneously of the form phi and psi and also phi implies psi or any other combination. Again, this is because in principle, there could have been several ways of constructing chi according to the inductive definition. And so there could be several possible last steps that created the formula. On the other hand, for this proof, that isn't really a problem that, well, chi could be several of these options because we're going to go through each option and show that points A through C hold uh, for that option. So this means that regardless of which uh, option actually applies, even if it's multiple ones, uh, points A through C will hold. Okay, so we're again going to do a case split on all of these cases. And well, because these cases will be very similar, so the same argument will essentially apply to all of them, I'm just going to do the case of conjunction in detail. And then we'll see that in fact, the same argument holds also for the other cases. Okay, so we're going to suppose um, that chi uh, is in fact equal to phi and psi like this for some formulas phi and psi. Now in this case, well, the complexity of these formulas phi and psi will be strictly less than the complexity of chi. So then uh, phi and um, psi have a complexity uh, strictly less than k. Why is this the case? Well, recall that the complexity of a formula is just the number of connectives occurring in it. And we know that chi has complexity k, which means there are k connectives occurring in chi. Moreover, now we're assuming that chi has this form here, which means that, well, this conjunction here is one of those k connectives. In particular, this means that this specific conjunction symbol can't occur in phi or in psi. And therefore, it's impossible for phi to have the same complexity as chi because we know that one of the connectives of chi does not belong to this formula phi. Exactly the same argument holds for psi. We know that this connective here does not belong to psi and therefore it can't have exactly the same number of connectives as chi does. All right, so this means now because phi and psi have complexity strictly less than k that we can inductively assume that points A through C apply to these uh, formulas, phi and psi. Okay, so hence uh, phi and psi uh, satisfy uh, points A through C. And now what we'll need to do is we'll need to verify points A through C for the more complex formula chi. The way we're going to do this is we're going to list all initial segments of chi and calculate their depth. So the initial segments um, of chi are the following. So first we just have the opening parentheses. And then the next initial segment has the following form. So it's the opening parentheses and then some segment S, which is a proper initial segment of phi. So here S is a proper um, initial uh, segment of uh, the formula phi. Okay, the next um, initial segment we have for chi is where we have the opening parentheses and then the entire formula phi. Next we have, well, the opening parentheses phi and the, the conjunction symbol. Then the next uh, initial segment occurring is where we have phi um, and t, where here t is again a proper um, initial uh, segment of psi. And next we go on and we have then the entire formula uh, psi. 
And finally, we have the entire formula chi, so we have also these closing parentheses. All right, so these uh, are all the initial segments of chi, where we've grouped together certain initial segments like here. So this uh, covers uh, a, a large class of initial segments where S can be any proper initial segment of phi. So I hope it's clear what's going on here. We're just moving along um, chi along this direction and sort of cutting off all of these initial segments and that's what we get. Now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the depth for each of these initial segments. So let me move that over a bit and then I write D uh, for depth. So uh, the first initial segment here has depth one because we're just opening uh, a parentheses and that's uh, uh, all that's happening. Now the next case is more complicated. So here we have these opening parentheses and then we have um, S uh, which is a proper initial segment of phi. Now, inductively, we know that phi satisfies points uh, A through C. In particular, it satisfies point B, which says that every proper initial segment of, well, the formula in this case phi has depth greater than zero. So this means that the depth of this entire initial segment here will be strictly greater than one because we have these opening parentheses occurring here. And also um, S has a depth which is strictly greater than zero. Okay, so this brings us to the next uh, segment here, which is where we have these opening parentheses and then the entire formula phi. Now again, because phi satisfies uh, A through C, we know that its depth overall is zero. So in the formula phi, the opening and the closed parentheses are balanced, which means that this uh, initial segment here has depth one because we just have one opening parentheses. And then we're opening probably a bunch more parentheses, but we're always closing those in, in the formula phi. Okay, then the next segment here also has uh, depth one because we're just adding this conjunction symbol here, which doesn't count for the depth. Next, we have a situation that's sort of similar to what's occurring in this case, where we have a proper initial segment of the formula psi in this case, and we're opening one parentheses and then well, we're like, we know this uh, formula phi here has depth zero. And then we also add this proper initial segment of psi. Now again, because psi satisfies point B, we know that this proper initial segment here, T, will have a depth strictly greater than zero, which means that overall, this uh, segment here will have a, a depth which is strictly greater than one because we're also uh, opening this parentheses here. All right, now we have this next case where we have psi occurring in its entirety. So here, um, both psi and phi overall have depth zero, and we're now opening uh, parentheses there, so this will have depth one. And then in the final formula here, we have depth zero because we're now also closing uh, the parentheses. Observe that this last formula here is actually equal to chi. And therefore, we've shown that in fact, chi itself has depth zero because, well, this formula here is chi. Next, let's check point B. So point B says that every proper initial segment of chi has a depth strictly greater than zero. So now if we just look at these uh, initial segments here, we see that all of their depths are strictly greater than zero. So in fact, point B also holds for the formula chi. And finally, point C, says that if chi has complexity strictly greater than zero, so that's uh, what we're assuming in this case here, um, then there should be exactly one connective at depth one. And this is in fact the head of chi. So let's uh, see whether that's the case. Well, you can see here that there are only uh, four places where the depth is exactly one. And well, we can see that uh, in this case, there's no connective occurring. In this case, there's also no connective occurring. Here, there's the connective conjunction occurring. And well, here, there's also uh, no additional connective occurring. So the only case where we actually have a connective at depth one is this one. And that is in fact the head of chi by definition of the head. So the head, remember, was the last connective we introduced in the uh, inductive definition. Okay, so just by enumerating these uh, initial segments of chi under the assumption that it had uh, the specific form, 
uh, we know that uh, now A through C um, hold also for, for the formula chi. Okay, so now basically we've proved one of these possible cases, and in principle we would have to do the same thing for each of these other cases. But now if you look at uh, these other cases here, and you think about what the initial segments are, you'll see that they're exactly the same as for this case with the conjunction, except that this conjunction symbol here would be replaced by whatever other connective we're using. So in fact, this argument kind of covers all of these cases over here. So the only case that remains is this uh, case here where we have this negation. And well, the proof there is basically the same as well. So you just uh, write out all of the initial segments. So that would start with the opening parentheses, then you have this opening parentheses plus the negation. And you see there already that negation occurs at depth one. And well, then we have a bunch of proper initial segments of phi occurring, but those all have depth strictly greater than zero. So there's no other connectives uh, there occurring at depth one. And then eventually we uh, have phi done and close the parentheses, but there's no additional connectives occurring there. So also uh, A through, through C will hold for uh, formulas of this form. If you have doubts, you should just go ahead and write out um, all of the initial segments on your own and uh, check for yourself that A through C holds. So with that, I'm going to declare uh, this lemma here proved. As you can see, the proof is not particularly difficult. The difficult part really is actually formulating the right type of um, inductive hypotheses which are going to apply later on in the proof. So once you actually have the statement here of the lemma, proving it um, is pretty straightforward. You just need to kind of check that all of these things hold. But if you were actually trying to prove this for yourself, well, formulating these uh, points in exactly the way that they're going to be useful in the proof, that's, that's really the challenge. This finally brings us to the unique parsing theorem, which will conclude this video. So it says that if we're given some formula chi in the language LP sigma, then chi has exactly one of the following forms. So either chi is an atomic formula, or chi is a negation of some formula phi, or chi has exactly one of these following forms that uh, uses a binary connective. So chi could be um, phi and psi, phi or psi, uh, phi implies psi or phi if and only if psi, and chi is exactly one of those in that case. And finally, these formulas uh, phi and psi that occur here in this uniquely determined form of chi, they themselves are uniquely determined. So we can recover them based on the structure of chi. Okay, so let's prove this. Well, basically there's not a whole lot to prove because of this uh, lemma we had previously, which says that every uh, formula has a unique head. In particular, this means that we can't simultaneously be in uh, multiple ones of these cases. So the fact that chi has exactly one of these forms follows from the fact that chi has a unique head, which has to have been the last rule which we applied in its construction. And since that is unique, there can only be one such last rule. On the other hand, we can determine whether chi is atomic or not just by, by looking at it. So uh, inspection uh, shows if uh, chi is atomic. So you just look at the formula and see whether it contains any connectives. If not, it's atomic. If it does, then it's not atomic. So we would be in case uh, B or C. So let's suppose uh, that it's not. So in this case, we can say that chi has to, well, be one of these forms. So it'll necessarily start with an opening parentheses. So the first uh, symbol uh, of chi uh, will be the opening parentheses symbol. And well, now we can check the second symbol. So if the second um, is the negation symbol, uh, then we are in case B. And uh, otherwise, uh, we are in case C. 
So again, because chi follows this inductive definition, we know it has to have at least one of these forms. And by the lemma, we know that it, well, can't have more than one form. And in fact, we can just look at the second symbol of the formula to see whether it's in case B or in case C. So in this case C, we see that in every case we have opening parentheses and then phi occurring. And phi itself starts with parentheses, so the second symbol here will never be a negation symbol. Okay, and now uniqueness um, of uh, the head of the formula, so the head of chi um, makes, well, all of the forms in C uh, exclusive. So chi can have at most one of those forms. The last thing we need to check is that we can uniquely recover these formulas phi and psi based on the structure of chi. So in the case where chi is atomic, there are no uh, subformulas, so that's fine. In the case B here, how do we recover the formula phi? Well, we already know that in this case, the first two symbols of this formula are the opening parentheses and the negation. And so everything to the right of the negation symbol uh, minus this closing parentheses will be phi. So we can get phi by just moving in, well, two symbols, then taking all the symbols to the right of that, except for these closing parentheses. So in that case, uh, we've recovered phi, which means that it's itself uniquely determined. A similar uh, argument works for uh, case C, but it's a bit more complicated. So we know from the lemma that we can identify the head of the formula. So that's uh, whatever connective occurs as the head. For example, if you wanted to do this concretely, you could just walk through the formula and track the depth. And then, well, the head is that connective which occurs at depth one. And the lemma said that this is unique. So basically, we can figure out where the head of a formula is. And then, well, in say this case, phi would be everything that occurs to the left of the head minus these opening parentheses. And psi would be everything occurring to the right of the head minus the closing parentheses. So this shows that you can recover the formulas phi and psi based on uh, chi if chi has this form. And the same argument applies to the other forms that chi could have in case C. Now I'm not going to write this down because I'm out of space and also it would require like a paragraph of text just to make that point which I explained in words. So again the reason these uh, phi and psi are unique is because if we know in what case we're in we can uh, just remove symbols uh, until we get the, the formula in question. Okay, so that concludes all of what I wanted to say in this video. So we've seen how we can formally define a language for propositional logic. Uh, we've given the definition of a formula, which was inductive. And now finally, we've proved that in fact, this definition is a good one, meaning that uh, using it allows us to create unambiguously interpretable formulas. Moving forward, actually the only thing we'll care about uh, for our formulas is in fact that this theorem here holds. So if you wanted to, you could somehow come up with a different way of creating formulas for propositional logic. And as long as it satisfies this unique parsing theorem, that would also be a valid way of constructing formulas. For instance, one approach is to just take parsing trees themselves as formulas and well, in that case, because a parsing tree already describes how to parse the formula, this unique parsing theorem is somehow superfluous. On the other hand, writing down parsing trees in proofs is really tedious. So it's nice to know that there is like some way you can write formulas on a line that still satisfies unique parsing. And one way to think about the system is that it's kind of like a flattened version of a parsing tree. With that, we've now described the syntax for propositional logic. And in the next video, we'll be turning to semantics to show how we can actually interpret these formulas um, in terms of truth values.